Welcome to the deep dive where we cut through the noise to get you well informed on the topics that matter. Today, we're diving into something uh, really remarkable, the US Navy's Virginia Block V submarine. You might have seen reports like one from the Visgrad Post that China actually called it a merciless hunter. That definitely caught our eye. It's a label that certainly makes you pay attention, doesn't it? Absolutely. So in this deep dive, we're going to unpack what makes this sub such a, well, a game changer in undersea warfare. Our mission, as always, is to cut through the noise, look at the tech, the strategy, and maybe some surprising roles it plays beyond combat. We're drawing on the sources you've shared to give you a clear, concise picture of this uh, silent guardian. So that merciless hunter label. It's pretty intense. What's the core capability that really earns it such a, well, such an ominous description for the Virginia Block V? At its heart, the Virginia Block V is a next generation attack sub. It's designed to blend um, really advanced tech with capabilities we haven't seen before. The first thing you notice is it's bigger. It is an enlarged hull, specifically an 84 foot section added right in the middle. 84 feet, that's significant. It is, and it's not just for show. That extra space holds four large diameter tubes. Each of those can carry seven Tomahawk cruise missiles. Seven each? Wow. Yeah, so you add those to the missiles already in the bow, and the Block V's total capacity jumps to 40 cruise missiles. 40. Okay, that's a big number. But it's more than just raw firepower. It's really designed as a multi-mission submarine. It can deploy things like unmanned undersea vehicles, UUVs, and maybe even hypersonic prompt strike missiles down the line. It's basically built to take over roles from the Navy's older guided missile subs that are retiring soon. Uh, yeah. In fact, one retired officer we saw quoted called this a major cultural shift for the submarine community because its mission set is just so much broader now. A cultural shift, that's a powerful phrase. What does that really mean in practice for you know, how the Navy operates or even thinks about its subs? It really implies a wider mandate, I think. Yeah. Moving beyond the traditional sub hunting or ship hunting roles, it means the force is adapting, uh, integrating these new technologies, taking on strategic strike roles that used to belong to bigger, maybe more specialized ships. So new training, new doctrines. Absolutely. And probably changes in how they recruit and develop sailors to manage all these diverse missions. Hmm. Now, as you can probably guess, this kind of capability doesn't come cheap. Each Block V costs over three and a half billion dollars. A billion with a B. Yep. The whole program is valued at over $22 billion, maybe hitting $35 billion if they acquire all 10 planned boats. It's actually the biggest shipbuilding project in Navy history. Wow. So for you, our listener, the, the takeaway here isn't just bigger boat. It's really about a fundamental shift, a redefinition of undersea warfare towards this um, incredibly adaptable, heavily armed platform. Exactly. And that massive firepower upgrade, there's a very specific critical reason for it. It's tied to the looming retirement of the Navy's four Ohio-class guided missile submarines, the SSGNs. They're set to retire by 2028. Right, the ones that carry a huge number of Tomahawks. It's a huge number. Each one carries up to 154 Tomahawks currently. Right. That's an enormous amount of conventional firepower that the Block V is specifically designed to help replace. Okay, here's where it gets really interesting then. How exactly does the Block V fill that gap? I mean, 40 missiles is a lot, but 154 is, well, it's a lot more. What does this mean for strategic power? It addresses it directly with something called the Virginia Payload Module, or VPM. It's VPM. The DPM is that 80-foot hull section we mentioned earlier. It's engineered specifically to dramatically boost missile capacity. It effectively turns the Block V into a kind of floating missile battery. Right, so going from the older Virginia class, yeah. Uh, what was their capacity? The earlier Virginias carried 12 Tomahawks. The Block V with the VPM carries 40. 12 to 40, that's a massive jump. It is. And it enables what's called mass fires. Basically, the ability to launch an overwhelming simultaneous barrage of precision missiles. Think about it. With 10 Block V subs, which were already acquired between 2019 and 2023, commanders could, in theory, launch up to 400 Tomahawks almost simultaneously. 400? That's staggering. And the Tomahawk itself is incredibly sophisticated now. The Block 4 versions can fly up to 900 miles at 550 miles per hour. They have two-way data links, so they can loiter over an area, change targets mid-flight, even act a bit like a drone, doing some ISR intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. So they're smart missiles too. Very smart. But the real breakthrough, especially from a hidden platform like a sub, is the tactical maritime tomahawk. Mm. It can hit moving targets, things like vehicle convoys on land or ships at sea. That's a huge tactical advantage. Hitting moving targets from an invisible platform. 
Yeah, that completely changes the game for any potential adversary. But let's dig into the why. Why is this kind of mass long range precision strike so vital, particularly in contested areas, say like the Pacific? Is it just about brute force or is there a deeper strategic play here? It's definitely both. Strategically, it's about deterrence. Deterrence by, well, denial making aggression too costly and deterrence by punishment. Being able to launch such a powerful, coordinated strike from a platform nobody can find makes any adversary think twice, maybe three times. Makes sense. And in a place like the Pacific, with huge distances and complex defenses, what they call anti-accessoria denial, or A2AD, having this mobile, hidden strike power is critical. It lets you project power without needing vulnerable surface ships or fixed land bases nearby. Right. And speaking of hidden, let's shift to stealth. That's the absolute core of submarine warfare, isn't it? How does the Virginia Block V manage to be so, well, undetectable? It really leans into advanced stealth tech, primarily through what they call the Acoustic Superiority Program. This involves a whole suite of upgrades, things like a new vertical sonar array, mm. better hull coatings, specifically anechoic coatings that absorb or scatter active sonar pings. Like soundproofing for the whole sub? Kind of, yeah. Well. Absorbing and deflecting sound waves plus lots of internal machinery quieting technology. All of this works together to make the Block V one of the absolute quietest submarines operating today. Another key piece is the propulsion system. Instead of traditional propellers, it uses water jets or pump jet propulsors, similar to those developed for British subs. And how does that help? It significantly reduces cavitation. That's the formation of noisy little steam bubbles caused by pressure drops around fast spinning blades. Less cavitation means much, much quieter movement through the water, making it incredibly hard to pick up on passive sonar. So quieter movement, better sound absorption. What else? Well, a really pioneering innovation is the use of photonic sensors or photonic masts. These replace the traditional periscopes that actually penetrate the hull. Photonic masts, so like cameras instead of optics. Exactly. High resolution cameras, infrared sensors, laser range finders, all housed in masts that don't need a hole through the pressure hull. That sounds like a structural advantage too. Huge advantage, ah. better structural integrity, and it lets them move the control room away from directly under the sail to a more optimal spot inside the hull. It's funny actually, one source mentioned the Navy had this unexpected problem. They had to figure out how to camouflage these new masts to look like old periscopes so enemies couldn't immediately identify the subtype just by looking at it. Ah, that's interesting. You need to look old tech to stay stealthy. Kind of, yeah. And finally, there's the open system architecture. Think of it like the F-35 fighter jet system. It allows for much easier and faster upgrades, new hardware, new software. They can do technology insertions every four years or so, and advanced processor builds every two years. Keeps the sub cutting edge without needing a total redesign. Wow, okay. So with all these stealth features combined, is it fair to think of this sub as almost like a ghost in the water? Something that can deliver a powerful punch without ever really being seen? That's a very good analogy, I think. It's designed for such acoustic discretion, such stealth, that tracking it becomes incredibly difficult for any adversary. That gives it unparalleled freedom to move and, if necessary, strike. Okay, so if it's this, this underwater ghost, does that unique stealthiness allow it to do things beyond just combat? Stuff we might not typically associate with a war machine. Oh, absolutely. When you move beyond just the combat aspect, submarines protect nations in uh, broader, sometimes quite surprising ways. Take strategic nuclear deterrence, for instance. The US military relies on a nuclear triad, bombers, land-based missiles, and submarines. And the Navy's strategic subs, the SSBNs, carry something like 70% of the nation's deployed nuclear arsenal. 70%, wow. Yeah. And there's that famous saying, you know, it's easier to find a grapefruit-sized object in space than a submarine at sea. Their undetectability makes them the most survivable leg of the triad. They can't easily be taken out in a first strike, which makes them a very stable deterrent. So their invisibility is their strength, paradoxically helping keep the peace. Exactly. It changes the whole calculation for potential aggressors. And even conventional attack subs like the Virginia class, their presence, their ability to patrol unseen, holds potential adversaries at risk constantly. They also play a huge role in protecting what are called sea lines of communication, or SLOCs. Global trade routes, basically. Right. The vast majority of global trade travels by sea. Submarines help safeguard these routes, deterring piracy or attacks, protecting vital economic interests. Hmm. I hadn't really thought about that specific role. And then there's a technology angle. Developing these incredibly complex machines pushes the boundaries of engineering and tech. 
Things developed for subs like advanced materials, power systems, even breakthroughs in things like 3D printing for complex parts often find applications in the civilian world later on. So military tech driving civilian innovation. It happens quite often. And finally, though it's maybe a secondary mission, subs are sometimes used for environmental monitoring and scientific research. They can study marine life, underwater geology, ocean currents, even contribute to seismic studies, helping us understand things like underwater earthquakes. Fascinating. So for you listening, the takeaway here is that these vessels are much more than just weapons platforms. They're these vital multi-purpose national assets, ensuring deterrence, protecting trade, driving innovation, even helping with science. And looking ahead, the Virginia class is really designed for what they call no limits upgrades. No limits. What does that mean in practice? It means they can integrate groundbreaking new technologies without needing entirely new hull designs each time. We're already seeing it. Things like fly-by-wire ship control, like modern aircraft. Yeah. Enhanced sonar systems, there's something called the Large Aperture Bow Array. Fiber optic links for the periscope visuals instead of direct optics. Even special lockout trunk areas for special operations forces to exit and enter the sub while underwater. Wow, constantly evolving. Definitely. And a huge area of focus right now is wireless undersea connectivity. That sounds tricky. Radio waves don't travel well underwater, right? Exactly. That's the core challenge. Radio frequency is basically useless down there. So there's a lot of work on non-electromagnetic ways to transmit data. The goal is real-time data sharing, especially with those UUVs we mentioned, which can be launched from the missile tubes. Imagine a sub deploying a swarm of sensor drones and getting data back instantly. That would be a massive capability boost. Huge. And if that wasn't ambitious enough, there's a serious long-term plan to potentially equip Virginia subs with high-energy laser weapons. Lasers on a submarine. Yeah. We're talking powerful lasers, maybe 300 to 500 kilowatts, built right into the photon mass assembly. What would they be used for? Could be anything from disabling sensors on enemy ships or aircraft, maybe even defending against incoming missiles or drones. The timeline is maybe the mid-2030s, and it would leverage the sub's incredibly powerful nuclear reactor. We're talking around 30 megawatts of power generation. Lasers powered by a nuclear reactor on a stealth sub. That's some serious future tech. But, okay, these plans are incredibly ambitious. What's the reality check here? What are the major hurdles in actually building these advanced subs, getting the new tech integrated, and just maintaining the fleet? Yeah, that's where we bump up against what some of the sources frankly call fragilities in the American shipbuilding sector. Fragilities? Like what? Yeah. Well, just recently, Electric Boat, one of the two shipyards that builds these subs, got a nearly billion-dollar contract modification, almost $987 million. And that money isn't just for building subs. It's specifically aimed at boosting the whole submarine industrial base. Okay, what does boosting the base involve? It focuses on things like developing critical components, modernizing the actual shipyard infrastructure, expanding the network of key suppliers, essentially trying to remove bottlenecks in the whole production pipeline. And why is that so urgent now? Because the Navy is really struggling to keep its attack submarine numbers up. The older Los Angeles-class boats are retiring faster than New Virginia's are coming online partly due to production delays. So delays are a big issue. They have been. The specific challenges mentioned include not having enough skilled workers, yeah. welders, pipe fitters, engineers, shortages from suppliers for complex parts, and just generally shipyard infrastructure that hasn't fully kept pace with the demands of building these incredibly complex vessels. It highlights how the Navy often relies on extra supplemental funding just to try and close these capacity gaps in shipbuilding and maintenance. Yeah. It's a persistent challenge. Right. So we've covered a lot today. We've really taken a deep dive into the Virginia Block V submarine, this merciless hunter. We've looked at its incredible firepower with the VPM, its cutting edge stealth tech from quiet propulsion to photonic masts, and even its surprising roles beyond just combat. It's clear this isn't just a technological marvel. It's a, um, a really critical piece in global power dynamics, a true silent guardian. Absolutely. And that strategic weight, combined with the constant need and the challenges we just discussed to innovate, build, and maintain that technological edge, well, this just can't be overstated. It's a continuous effort. So maybe a final thought for you, our listener, to ponder as we wrap up. As technologies like advanced AI and sophisticated unmanned systems keep evolving at this incredible pace, how will the silent service, the submarine force, have to adapt its role, its capabilities, to stay the ultimate deterrent in what's clearly becoming an, an even more complex and contested world?